to see you all. And, and, uh, and right now I'm sitting at our office in, in downtown Copenhagen in Denmark. It's uh, getting very dark outside, but uh, yeah, this is, uh, we, we're in that part of the, of, of the world. And um, yeah, looking very much forward to talk about uh, yeah, war gaming and how we apply it in a, in, a, in a corporate kind of setup normally. Uh, and I suppose some of you have a military background or interest and so forth. I, I, I've never been in the military. We are, we are inspired by also like the military tradition of war gaming, but mainly try to apply these kind of tools for, for different kind of corporate clients. Um, yeah, so I, I prepared, you know, some 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 uh, some cases and examples of how we approach it, and uh, but also looking forward to to discuss with you. Um, so perhaps Sebastian, during the session, if I can ask you to to watch out for for any questions or or, or comments in the chat, and I think that we can like pick them up throughout the session, and then at the end we we have time for like some yeah Q and A and discussion. I hope this is okay. Yeah, sounds great. Sounds great. I'll keep an eye out for questions as well that pop up in the chat. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of them. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Perfect. And let me start screen sharing. Uh, I hope you can see my screen now. And I'm just going to go presentation mode. All righty. Does it look good? Yes. Perfect. So uh, yeah, so so let's get into it. So so uh, yeah, as, as as mentioned, my name is is uh, is Esk. I'm uh, yeah, we're based out in Copenhagen in Denmark, and I'm heading like a small change agency called Works. I think we're like thirty people in the in the core staff, and and work with change in big organizations. And we're not traditional management consultants, so we don't tell people how to how to make their strategy, how to run the business. But we support on like the human side of change efforts. So when you want to roll out a new strategy, you want to work with culture change and so forth, this is where we, we play a role. And the majority of our clients is like large private companies. We work with like the majority of the biggest companies in, in Denmark and Scandinavia, but also have you know a lot of clients internationally. And, and either we work with specific clients ourselves or we have different kind of local partners, consultancies, or business schools that use some of our games with their with, with their clients. And I think our games are out in like fourteen different languages or so. So so yeah, coming out of Denmark, but 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 have a you know have, have a lot of experience also working with with using these kind of tools across organizations. And 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 privately, I've been uh, you know fascinated with games since I was a small kid. I think my favorite war game is uh, is the old Avalon Hill game uh, Flat Top about the, the 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 aircraft carrier wars in the beginning or, or the middle of the of, of Second World War in, in in the Pacific, and also I'm a big fan of of games like Twilight Struggle and Twilight Imperium, but it, but it's hard to find the, the the proper time to play them, but but really enjoy it. Okay, so so uh, so I've been working and together with my colleagues with 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 the games for yeah more than twenty years, and and when we started using these kind of of, of tools, it was a bit exotic, and and we and we discovered that they made a lot of sense and were very well received across our clients back then, mainly out of Denmark, and then later we start to also work with them with international clients. And these pictures is from one of our games. It's a game about change management called Wall Breakers. And as you can see, it's a physical game. So in a digital world, I think in some ways we're like very old school. We really see these games as like talking pieces and uh, and, and like, you know, creating like this kind of, of shared reference that can facilitate good discussions, learning with your peers and so forth. And and this game on the on the on, on the floor is like one of these games. And it's about how to lead a, a team through a change process. Uh, each team is represented by a boss. And, and during the change, some of your colleagues are going to get frustrated and they're like the passengers on the bus. So they're going to fall off the, off the bus. And then the game is about you know, learning how to get back on the bus. And, and what's, it was interesting that when we started working with this game, for instance, with, with Danish clients, you know, it worked very well. But we were like very curious when we came into the world. And what has been nice to discover for the past yeah, more than 10 years 
is really that you know everybody likes to play everybody like game game uh, and playful ways of, of of learning and 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 working with change so these pictures i think starting from top that's indonesia it's china it's south africa and it's uh, i think saudi arabia so we have a pleasure of, of working with these kind of games across different cultures and backgrounds and everybody likes to play so i think this is really for us like the starting point is not something coming out of a of a particular tradition it is like very you know human across cultures uh, along the lines so regarding what we're going to cover now i think first of all just try to give you a fly in regarding how we 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 tend to use these kind of, of games and and just sharing you know different different cases and examples and then a few years back we did a research collaboration with the copenhagen business schools and and some other institutions that did some very interesting insights into really what is the effect of these kind of tools. Is it just like a nice experience or does it really, you know, support? And uh, and, and I just want to share a few of these insights from that research. And then I guess follow up, try to wrap it up with some do's and don'ts and, and some good discussions. So that's the basic plan. Okay, so let's look at how international corporations use these kind of game-based tools. And this is regarding supporting strategic transformations. So we also created games that, that have like very specific topics, like for instance, working like safety culture or how to be better at, at selling to your customers or product launches and so forth. But for this session, I tried to focus on games that, that help to drive strategic changes at different levels. <clears throat> And, uh, and of course, as, as I've, uh, I'm sure many, the most of you know, is that, that using games is not something new that was invented recently. It's like a very, very old tradition. And, 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 and I think in many ways, like the first games about strategy, leadership, and so forth were designed before the first books were written about these, uh, these uh, topics. So this is like the very classic example, the King Game of Ur, you know, going back 5,000 years or perhaps even more. Then, of course, we have like the very strong tradition out of, 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 of India. This is like one of the earlier version of what was turned into chess later in, 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 in across the world and also in Europe. This game from ancient China is one of my personal favorites. I originally studied political science and, and was uh, like on a career path to become like a state bureaucrat. And this game is, in fact, a training game, learning people more than a thousand years back how to pass an exam to get a job by the central government in China to become a bureaucrat. So, so just that I think, yeah, interesting example that 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 that, that some of my you know predecessors working with with with, uh, with the politics and and so forth still back then used games to prepare for exams. And then of course, much more recently, like the the, the, the Prussian tradition of using Kriegspiel and so forth. And I think th this is a key source of inspiration for us and how we we try to work with it. So yeah, a very strong tradition, and of course, uh, heavily supported by military use in different kind of ways. And I'm sure many of you are, are, are more experts in, in this uh, aspect than I am. But uh, but uh, but but uh, but but the same uh, the same still. I'm I'm gonna just start out with a quick war story. And uh, and this is inspired by a British scholar called Stephen Bongay. And we're gonna go back to uh, I think it was 1806. And back then, in the, in the in the southern parts of what was Prussia back then, there was like a big battle going on between the young Emperor Napoleon with his French army, and then I think there was like on the opposite side, like three Prussian armies tried to to beat him, and uh, and it was a huge battle outside the city of Vienna, and uh, and it was in the fall, and the Prussians started out being fairly confident because they were they had like you know a very disciplined well organized army and also like twice the number of troops as the French and the French army were uh, more like a mix had a lot some old guard but a lot of young recruits and especially like the French officers were like very young so much less experienced compared to the Prussian army so the the the, the Prussians had like a, a fair degree of confidence in that morning on the battlefield when they started out but fairly soon they realized they were in for a tough day because the, 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 the French didn't do as the Prussians had expected. And the young, Prus the young French officers took a lot of chances, you know, uh, exploiting opportunities uh, in the battlefield throughout the, throughout the day. And it was very hard for like the large, rigid uh, Prussian army 
to adapt to these kind of changes. And they ended up suffering like a huge defeat. And, and one of the young uh, Prussian officers that was part of the battle was uh, was Karl von Clausewitz. And he uh, later was, was put into to, uh, to French uh, captivity and had some time afterwards to reflect and think about it. And later uh, wrote uh, the famous book, uh, Biskrieg, about his insights. And I'm just gonna share like a simple model that is inspired by some of his insights. Uh, and again, based uh, or very much inspired by Stephen Bunge's work. And, uh, and, 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 and the thought from Clausewitz and later on, you know, continued by von Molge, the Elder and so forth, was a realization that it's very hard to, to drive change in, in big organizations when you work with people. And, and they identified what's called like three gaps that creates friction in organizations, make it hard to execute. And of course, it's very interesting to look into how, how the Prussian army back then used these insights and later on, you know, reformed the whole military, created a new military academy in Potsdam and introduced like the whole Austras. Uh, approach to, to how to lead organizations. I'm not going to go into that track, but uh, but just want to share this model. And this model is about getting stuff done. So at the top, we have like, okay, what do we want to achieve? There's like a strategic intent. And then we create some plans and they are turned into actions. So a basic model about getting stuff done. But what the Clausewitz and his peers realized that, it, well, it's not so easy working with people. So they identified three gaps and the first gap is like the knowledge gap. So that's about like insufficient information about the world because the world is a very complex place, especially when we try to look into the future. So we only have limited insights when we make our plans. We might expect the enemy to have 10,000 troops and plan accordingly, but it might turn out they had 20,000 troops instead. Or we might plan to fight on a sunny day and then it might turn out raining instead. So limited insights uh, the, in, in making the plans. Then we have the alignment gap. And that might not be relevant in, in, in the organization where you work, but I'm sure you heard about it. And that is the difference between what is planned and what goes on. And I think that in most organizations, there is a lot of, is a lot of activities that are not part of the plans. And also there's like planned activities that don't happen. So the alignment gap is like, a, so, you know, there is some leeway in the steering in organizations. So we don't have perfect insights. We make some plans, not perfect. Then we start implementing and stuff happens, but not always as intended. And that leaves us with a third gap, the effect gap. Because when you do the planning, it's very hard to predict what kind of specific actions will, will deliver uh, the outcomes you're looking for. You might, you might uh, expect that, well, if we take the hill and start shooting at the enemy, they're going to surrender. But they might, out, they might end up counterattacking instead of just being dug in and, and waiting us out. And that is very hard to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to estimate when, when we are in the planning phase. So all in all, three gaps that makes it hard to get stuff done in big organizations. And, uh, and of course, the whole Prussian tradition of, of Austria's tactic and later, you know, mission command and so forth in NATO, try to, to find ways of handling these kind of gaps. What I'm going to do uh, now is just use these gaps as a way of like structuring different ways of using game-based training and involvement. So just use them as like three different perspectives. And again, it's like a broad structure. Some of our solutions like overlap between them. But still, as, as, at least for, from my side, it helps to get an understanding of, 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 of different ways of deploying a game. So let's start to look at the knowledge gap. So this is about how can you use wargaming and games to get a better understanding of what we call, might call like the landscape. So what kind of environment do are, are we facing as an organization? So when I have to like you know implement a new strategy, what are the competitors going to do? What kind of trends? You know, what should I what should I be mindful about when I start executing? So these kind of simulations is not about you know learning how to execute a specific plan, but more about get a sense of like the complexity that I that that, that we might look into. And and we call them sometimes war rooms or war games or like industry simulations. And, uh, and, and this picture is from a session we did a good number of years back for like one of the very biggest European companies within the pharma sector. 
where we help them to design a number of, of, uh, of, of simulations where we look at the coming five years on one of the key of, of one of the key uh, treatment lines. And in this game, they were not allowed to play the, their own company, but they were like playing all the competitors. So pressure testing their own strategy from outside to get a better understanding of the kind of environment and what do they would face when they had to go out and, and execute the strategy. And in fact, this picture is one of five rooms. So we designed five versions of the game, looking at the five key markets. And I think this room, as you see in this picture, that was like the European market. And then at the same time, we have another room with like the Japanese market, the Chinese market and so forth. Really get a good understanding of these kind of setups. So this is games that are about like exploring that kind of landscape, addressing the knowledge gap. And as you can see in this example here, the main component of the game was like a physical tool. So a game card, a game board with cards and then game pieces and so forth. And again, using these games as a way of like creating like meaningful conversations. And, uh, and the key element here is, uh, again, we want people to learn from each other. Uh, also, of course, learn a bit from the game. But this is also where we are a little bit, you know, holding back regarding using too much technology because we don't want people just looking at screens. But in this game, we use some iPads and so forth to, to support with additional information while you played the game. Um, another example is and a bit, perhaps a little bit closer to like the traditional ways of, 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 of using wargaming is regarding the crisis in Ukraine. And when we create these kind of, of, of solutions, often it's like internally in the organization. But sometimes we also use, this, use it as an opportunity to bring people together. So when the crisis in Ukraine and, and, and later on the war, when that started out in, 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 in 2014 and 15, we created like a war gaming sessions where we had like people from across different large Danish organizations to Danish with the Danish, together with the Danish Foreign Service and the Danish military, where we designed like one war gaming session where we tried to understand what was going on. So in this session, we had uh, we, we created like two teams, traditionally like you know red versus blue, and then try to play out the whole conflict, get an understanding of the different perspectives. And and when the when when the Ukrainian war restarted, you might say a year and a half ago, we created another war gaming session based on the same kind of principles, and again, just to get these people together and and create like a good brain trust, understanding what was going on, and during this game. Uh, it was very heavily game mastered, trying to find out the outcomes of different kind of actions. We had like a blue team and a red team, each making their decisions, and then and then they tried to uh, to to create like a possible outcome. And again, not trying to exactly predict the future. You know that is that is uh, in most cases you're going to miss it, but just to get a sense of like the complexity we were facing. What are like the tipping points? What what are like the dynamics? And especially it drove a lot of insights. Try to play the Russian part. So how to perceive from, from their point of view, you know, the, the actions of, 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 uh, of, of NATO and so forth, you know, how, how, how they perceived it as big aggressions and so forth. And in, in, in this game, we both you, you looked at like the military actions, but also on the diplomatic actions and politics and so on. Okay. Yeah, and then just another example. And again, I think a key ele element for us is to use these games as like a talking piece. So visualizing high complex uh, issues and so on. This is from a French pharma company. And then using again, again, uh, like these kind of games to, to, to get an understanding and try different kind of options. Because in, in this kind of setup, you can, you, can, you can try what if. So for some of these companies, we designed also... You know, when, when they, for instance, if they're like considering a, a, a possible uh, acquisition strategy or to, 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 to go into a specific direction regarding research and development, then we, we had like internal session where we tried to play it out. So using gamification to find out, well, if we, if we, if we take this strategic approach, what would that mean for competitors, for buyers, for different kinds of clients and so forth? Okay, so just try to wrap up uh, in, 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 in using games to navigate the knowledge gap. So it's about you know, like testing and reflecting on what if different scenarios of, of strategic options. And often these games have like an open outcome. So the whole point about the game that we don't know how it might end. And we don't know perhaps even what does winning look like. So the game is very much like a talking piece. 
And then a key insight from the game is really to change in the perspectives. So yeah, you know, and then the first example I shared from the pharma company really try to play all the competitors or play like, you know, the, the customers and so forth. And, and, and for me, this really brings a lot of good insights. Try to see yourself and your own actions from outside. And when we run these kind of games, often it's a combination of some game mechanics, but also a lot of game mastering. So for instance, the game we did regarding Ukraine, we had like a game master teams that was like people with a lot of experience, people coming, for instance, from like the Danish uh, 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 military, uh, what, what to call, you know, the, yeah, the, the, the Danish military and, the, and, they, uh, and their, uh, you know, secret service and so forth. So, so people were like deep insight regarding Russia and these kind of elements. So, so when we had the players, you know, come with different options, then we in the game mastering room really looked at well the combination of the Russian actions and these Western actions. What is the likely outcome? So a combination of game mechanics, but also game mastering. And and sometimes we design some of these solutions to be run multiple times, but often it's also like a one-off for a specific event or, or to test a specific strategy for one company. Okay. So, so that was about the knowledge gap. Then moving on, sometimes the challenge in organizations regarding driving change is about the alignment gap. So we have a strategy. We are fairly sure that it's going to be okay, but we have a, a, a challenge regarding how to make sure that people really know how to contribute to the strategy, how to create alignment regarding strategic intent and get like a deep understanding what entail, what the strategy entails and how to drive success. And, 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 and for working with this, we create like what we call like strategy simulations. So this is games not about making the strategy, but about understanding it as, as have a deep understanding of the strategy. And this picture is from a, uh, a very large uh, organization, uh, ISS, which was well, like one of the global industry leaders within like facility management and so forth. And I think they have like close to like 400,000 people worldwide uh, work you know, across multiple, multiple countries. And for them, we, we, we have over the years helped to develop like a number of, of, of strategy simulations. And again, these games is about really to help people to get like a deep understanding of the strategy. Because often like a company strategy is very vague. It's like a, a strategy house, a, a, a vision, some a few KPIs, some must win battles. But, but connecting that kind of, of strategy and big PowerPoint deck to the real world, that can be like quite a, a gap and a lot of confusions and so forth. So we use this kind of games really to get like a deep understanding of what it's really about. And you might say in, and again, this is overly simplified, but you might say that in these kind of games, in the first round, if you don't know the new strategy, you're going to be okay. In the second round, you're going to get in trouble. And in the third round, you're going to be out of business. So these kind of games are very normative. There is a, like a right and a wrong solution. And it is about helping people really to understand the strategy, what it's all about. Um, and there's different ways of, of deploying these. Um, this example uh, that I share here is from, uh, from also from ISS and, uh, and was used uh, a few years back uh, when they launched the new one ISS strategy across the world. And back then that was a, 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 in the midst of like the global pandemic. So, uh, so it wasn't possible to bring together like the, the global leadership team for a physical conference. So we did like a big virtual conference and then we had like local could almost call them like watch parties. So the local leadership team in France and Indonesia and Australia and so forth would gather together. And then everybody would be part of the same virtual kind of setup, you know, using you know, video conferencing and so on. But also we had like lo local versions of the same board game. So in these pictures, you can see people across the world on the same day playing the same war game. And again, this war game is about how to execute on the new one ISS strategy. And looking at how different, uh, you know, colleagues and functions within the organization must all work together and contribute in bringing the strategy uh, to life. And a more recent example, these photos are from uh, Mercedes-Benz Mobility. So the car producer and, uh, and, and we helped them earlier this year also to design a strategy game called Space 5. And again, using the game as a talking piece to get a, a, a strong understanding of the shared strategy. And this game was used, I think, in 35 different markets. And, uh, and we created, I think, in like 15 different languages. 
And again, not a game about making the strategy, but a game about really understanding what is it all about and how do different parts of the organization contribute. Um, so a little bit about creating these kind of games. And, and again, what we see often is the challenge in organization on this part is to both to help people understand where do we need alignment, but also finding out where can we have local autonomy. So this combination of, of okay, we, we need to know what we're fighting for. We need to know like the basic structures and how to do it. But also we have to bring on creativity about how to deliver the strategy, like in the German market or so forth. And, and we try to use these games to, to, uh, to, to sharpen that, that strong shared understanding. So, uh, so yeah, using the games to, to create like a unified understanding of the strategy, the business model or, or key ways of working. Sometimes it's like the big, you know, corporate global strategy. Other times it's more focused on it might be the sustainability strategy or within a, a specific business unit. And again, these games are normative. So, so in designing the game, there's like certain outcomes that are better than others. There is like certain kind of behavior or priorities or decisions that we like to emphasize in the game. And, and often this game is about, you know, helping leaders to, to balance different kinds of concerns. So for instance, a key element is often organizations that you need to look out for the business interest. You know, we need to run a, a sustainable business. But also we need to make sure that the customers are happy so they're going to stay with us. But also we also need to take good care of our people. And, and, and we don't want a situation where we're going to burn our colleagues to please the customers. You know, we want to create like a balance where we can have happy colleagues, but also happy customers and, and a sound business. So often the games is about this kind of balancing different kind of concerns and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and when facing these kind of tough decisions normally as a leader. And then also very much about connecting the big why, what, and how of the strategies. So about like the big aspirations, what is the value proposition, what we want to bring to our clients, and then looking at how do we deliver this and, and basically also helping people to understand within their function, how can I contribute and be a part of it. And, and the key challenge in making these designs is to find like the right level of, of detail and complexity. Because corporate life is super complicated, and especially these big, big organizations. And if you want to make a you know a one-to-one -one simulation, it's going to get way too complicated. So so the challenge here is to 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 find the right kind of balance. So we have you know the relevant piece of the complexity we take into the game, but also we use the game to simplify enough that we can understand these kind of dynamics. So we can talk about them, we can learn from each other, share war stories, and so forth. So 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 that's a that's a big challenge. And, and personally, you know, I'm, I very clearly have a tendency to over-design when I start these kind of processes. So normally, like the first version of these games are, are way too complicated. And then a big part of the refinement process, uh, your piloting, prototyping, is really try to simplify the design and finding out what is needed to bring out the right kind of conversations, um, not overdoing it. Okay, so moving on to the third gap, and this is like the effect gap. And, and this is very much about how to lead, how to bring the change or the strategy to life in the front line. So as a team leader, working on specific projects and so forth. So this is more about also the leader, you know, help leaders to, 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 to be good leaders and, and work with their colleagues. And, and these kind of solutions, we normally call like leadership simulations. And here you have one of my great colleagues, Klaus, um, and he's sitting with the game I also talked a little bit about at the beginning of the session called Wall Breakers. But, but it's like one of these kind of games. And, and this game is about leading change. So, so it's, it's based on like a generic case about a big merchant or organization. And then the game is about, you know, how to really work with, with, with change management, how to understand the different reactions of your colleagues, how they get frustrated, um, and, and also finding out then what should you do as a leader to like bring people out of resistance back on the bus in this example. And, 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 and we have over the years created like a portfolio of these different kinds of leadership simulations. And sometimes we, we, we create like bespoke design for a specific client, but it's really with these games, we, we see that they, you know, across organizations, there are some generic challenges regarding leadership that, you know, is hard for everybody. So, so for this, we have like a range of like generic leadership simulations that we use, you know, across different organizations. And, and just to give you like one example, this is, uh, 
This is from British Sail. So the national British sailing team, and I, I guess like also they're like, you know, looking at like the Olympics, like the, the, the most successful sailing team in, in history. And they have for a number of years used one of our leadership simulations called Bridge Builders to train. So, uh, and, and, and this game is about how to drive a high performing team and very much looking at how can you, how, how do we need to lead a team both for high alignment, but also high, high autonomy. And then also, and, and that's like represented directly on the game board, but then also you need to build relationships, build trust. And that's like the small slider you can see on the game pieces on the game board. So this game is about really helping people to, to drive high performing teams and finding out what kind of leadership is needed. And, and it used across different organizations and so forth. But, but in this example, used for like the whole training organization supporting the athletes from British Sailing about how really to, to, to create like very high functioning teams uh, working on, on, on these uh, sailboats. And, and, and we had, and it's interesting because most of our clients are, you know, large international corporations, but we had like a number of, of, of elite sport teams using these simulations as well as a way really to, to get a shared understanding and language to talk about driving high performance about leadership. And, and of course, uh, we had a lot of experience and, and, and we, and our, our point of the party was like physical games. So traditions of, of board games, but, uh, but doing, uh, doing COVID, it suddenly became impossible to bring people together. So we also had like, like the rest of the world to pivot to more like a virtual kind of setups across the world. And in the beginning, I was looking back very skeptical, skeptical regarding, well, you know, can this work out? And is it, is it, uh, you know, are people going to be engaged? Are they going to learn anything and so forth? But uh, but 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 I was surprised that that I think you can you can you can you can have you know good learning, good engagement, also virtually if you do it right. And and we've done a lot of work, try to take our physical games and turn them into different kind of virtual versions that uh, that that are useful. And and personally, I still you know enjoy bringing people together in the same physical room. But also, I think many times, you know, virtual sessions can be also, uh, yeah, very helpful and, and 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 nice. And in the beginning, our virtual versions were very rough. So basically, when we started out, just some interactive PowerPoints and, and and different ways of trying to set it up. And then later, we developed some more like elaborate kind of solutions. Are they using like virtual collaboration tools like Miro and Rule to to help run it, but also like you know specific. Uh, specific uh, web-based uh, solutions help to execute it and also make it more easy for the facilitators along the lines. And I think today, many of our solutions are, are, are deployed like a mix. So we have some of our partners internationally, we have like 40 pass partners in different countries. They use the games in person, some use it virtually, all mixed kind of setups. And, uh, and I think we see more and more when you have like a leadership team and you do some leadership development program, you can have some people you can bring together, but then you might also have a leadership team from, let's say, China, where it's impossible to fight them in. And then, you know, we need to do like a hybrid setup so they can also be included. Then I really love this picture. And, and I think what I mentioned earlier was also that we see these games as a way of creating like a, a shared reference. So a shared language to discuss, to discuss these kind of issues. And often what we do is that after we play the game, in, in in where it's like a fictional case, then we use the game board and 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 the game metaphor you might say to to talk about real life. And this picture is from a client from a, a very huge logistics company we worked with a few years back. And after playing the game, we asked all the participants to try to use the game pieces on the game board to describe their real situation. And this is like one project manager tried to describe her life. So she's like the game piece tried to drag the rest of her team in a change process going in the top gear. And, and this when when and when she presented this, it gave some very good discussions with her peers and also her boss. And, and and I recall like the boss asking, well, but this guy, you know, behind in resistance in the sidewalk, who is that? And then she had to say, well, you know, that's kind of you, because I don't think you've been supporting my efforts for, for the last couple of months. So again, using these games as bringing out these important candid conversations in in in, in uh, you know in, in a constructive way, and I think a key component in getting outcomes out of these games is that you have a combination of 
of the playfulness and a little bit like you know uh, you know the ease of of just playing a game but then you have to bring it back and get and, and, and to real life and and to make these kind of connections so normally when we design these kind of processes it's not only running a game but it's like an integrated piece like a learning program for let's say a group of managers where they might have you know three uh, three different kind of modules and sessions and then the game based elements are only going to be part of the activities where we try to bring new knowledge to life or try to test how we can put it put it to good use so so i think for me it's like very important that that if you want to have full benefits of the games in these kind of of of, of situations you know you have to add a lot of different kind of elements to it 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 it's it, it, it's not enough in itself So just wrapping up regarding using simulations to train people leadership. So, so this is very much about supporting reflection and critical thinking. And, uh, and I think a key insight here is also that, that when you lead people, there is not no perfect way because we're all different. So something that might work for Sebastian, well, I, I can't put it off because you know I don't have that leadership skills or it might work with one group of people, but not with another group of people. So I think when it comes to people leadership, working with colleagues, creating high-performing teams and so forth, it's really about, you know, having a good sense of what is like the leadership toolbox, have a sense about yourself as a leader, you know, your different kinds of strengths and, and, and weaknesses and so forth. And then really, you know, practice, you know, critical thinking regarding how to, to work with, with, with your colleagues. Uh, one of the business schools that we've been working with for a number of years is IMD out of Lausanne in Switzerland. And, and I think a key insight in their leadership approach is really to, to emphasize critical thinking. And they have a saying that if a student leaves, you know, their business school thinking about, well, now, you know, I have the perfect, you know, uh, checklist regarding how to, how to lead in the future, then they failed. Because it's really about, you know, inspiring people to find their own way and reflect about their own practice. And this is also what we try to bring in in these games. A key element here is also to help people to feel safe. And I think in many situations, you know, it's tough to be a, a leader in big organizations today. A lot of pressure. And in most cases, you know, you're, 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 you're used to operating at a very professional level and being good at what you do, making snappy decisions and so forth. And, 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 and suddenly, you know, working with change and development and so forth, suddenly try to do stuff that you're not used to doing suddenly try to do something where you're not sure, taking some risk and so forth, it can be very tough for all of us. And I think a big part of these games is like to lower the pressure. The pressure. So, so, so we have like a safe training ground where we can like, you know, make mistakes and, and, and have some good learnings where it's only like monopoly money and game pieces instead of real budgets and real, and real customers and colleagues and so forth. So, so we do a lot of, of emphasis regarding, you know, yeah, creating trust among the participants. We can have these good kind of discussions, making sure that that the game experience is not like an exam. It's not about winning, but it's about you know having these these uh, these uh, strong uh, discussions throughout the whole gaming sessions, and then help people then to have some insights they can use to have a better understanding of the real life challenges and inspire them to take specific actions. And again, as mentioned before, it's about creating this kind of a shared leadership language. And for instance, the, the game Wall Breakers, you can also see the picture here uh, with another of my colleagues, Rebecca. And, and, and in some, some organizations has been using this game as a number of years, you know, suddenly when, when two leaders discuss a situation and, and one leader says, well, well, but he, he fell off the bus, everybody knows what he's talking about. So, 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 so the game helps to create like a set language to talk about the, some of the tough issues you face as a leader. And then it's much easier to, to get help from your peers and so forth. A final note about these kind of games is that it's, it's and again, it's about bringing up these kind of conversations. And this is also why it's very important that you have strong facilitation skills. Because you need somebody in the room to help you to ask the curious questions, to probe reflection, to create connections between different dialogues and so forth. And, and for us, it's important that also, especially when we try to digitalize some of these solutions going virtual, that it doesn't turn into like individual e-learning. So it's not just me then answering some questions and, and so forth. It's not like playing a computer game, but it's having these kind of rich discussions where, where I work with my peers, I have a facilitator also provoking, provoking me a bit, supporting my learning journey and so forth. 
okay, so yeah, just try to cover different kind of aspects. And uh, and again, because games can be a lot of things and a lot of way to approach it. So just have the structure going back to Klausowicz regarding the knowledge gap, alignment gap, and the effect gap. I hope it makes sense to you. It For me, it's, it's helpful for try to structuring it. And perhaps we can take a few questions or comment, comments now, and then you know we can we can look into like the insights from 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 field research. So anybody with a question or Sebastian, if there's anything in the chat, there are a couple of things in the chat. Uh, quick one-off question: uh, Do you know what that Chinese game was that you briefly briefly flashed <laughs> at the beginning from Brian? Yeah, good. I, I think as I recall, I've, I've been introduced to it like the the Lee Hess. A bureaucrat training game, but but I don't have like a specific reference, but uh, but I might try to uh, to to find it. Um, I had the pleasure to know a, a historian who's like very much into almost like Indiana Jones style, you know, locating ancient learning games from like India and so forth. So so he's the one sometimes providing me with some of these you know historical inspirations. Okay. Uh, another question, are all the games you use ones that you've specifically designed, or do you also use, say, pre-existing games, commercial war games, or games such as those? I, I think that that working with our, yeah, our corporate clients, it's almost always like design, the games mm -hmm. that we have designed ourselves. It's all bespoke. Yeah. Yeah, and and then of course, but 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 we are of course inspired by by yeah different kind of of commercial games or and 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 so forth. Uh, but 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 normally yeah we have to make them bespoke. Mm -hmm. I have two questions here that kind of run together. First question: What would you say is the most important benefit of a face-to-face -face gaming session versus, say, a virtual one? And also on virtual sessions, what are some web-based software solutions slash apps you use for virtual simulations? Uh, two good questions. Um... I think a, a, I think a key benefit from the in-person part is that you can feel you have a better sense of each other. And I think often like some of the most important insights, you don't get them in the moment. You have them a little bit later on. So so I think that that, that the good thing about in-person session is then you have like the coffee break. You have the lunch together. You have like the small chit chat. And I think often, you know, my 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 epiphany or good insight is from these kind of you know reflections to half an hour after playing the game, talking with 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 one of the players and so forth. So I think that kind of social element is important part of the of 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 of, of the learning experience. Um, but then also when you have games that are more into like the more the more personal elements like the leadership games, mm. because then it can get also a little bit you know it's it's uh, it's important to create like a safe space and have some trust. And I think it's much better to sense each other and get trust in a physical room. I think if you if you already have trust, virtual can be okay. But if you don't know each other beforehand, I think trust is hard to establish virtually. Then, then we, it, it's easier to connect with people when we meet in person. Um, I think regarding like like digital platforms, I think my personal preference often is to use uh, you know, Mural which is, a, I'm sure many of you have tried it, but it's like a very basic setup, but just a nice virtual visual working space you can set up. But I think it's very easy to integrate different kinds of visual board games and so on. And, and as long as you have a game that does not require a lot of, of, of specific game mechanics and so forth, I think Miro is, is super nice to use. And then using it in combination with a, a video conferencing setup like Teams or, or Zoom. So I've done a lot of sessions with with Miro, and what is nice in Miro is that the you know the virtual workspace is infinite. So so for instance, I, I did a session for like a, a huge global uh, logistics company, where we had like the whole uh, Chinese leadership team being part of a session, and there we could create like in the same huge virtual workspace, we had like I think a, a separate like you know setup and a spacious and a separate like virtual game board for I think like 20 different teams, but on the same virtual setup. So as a facilitator, I could like zoom out and see everybody working at the same time and then zoom in and visit each of the teams while they're like running the session. So I think, you know, Miro is, I think is very nice for this. 
also in rural have like the same kind of functionalities. Um, and then when it has to be a little bit more complicated, also using game mechanics and so forth, we are using a platform called Gaminar, uh, which I think is, is is very nice for this. But uh, but but there's like many platforms around. Uh, I also know that that uh, that that regarding using the the more like the commercial games, you know, there's like tabletop simulator and others, mm -hmm. and and I haven't I haven't got a lot of experience working with these myself, but but uh, but as far as I know, you know, they are getting super sophisticated and very helpful. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm going to take one last question before we move on to your research insights. Uh, George, I'm sorry. I think your question, he kind of already answered a little bit about the after action review. I just wanted to address Lance's question here. Uh, so ask, you spoke kind of a little bit about balancing matrix adjudication across games. So Generally, how do you build simulations to reflect ethnic slash cultural differences in companies or cross geography? Or do you even account for that when you build a simulation? Do you kind of use simulations to maybe measure that? Very good question. I, I, we, 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 you know, uh, some of the games, for instance, I shared the example. If I just go back, like this, this game about uh, called Bridge Builders. <clears throat> And and this game address as a as a key part of the of, of of the game mechanics, you know, working with cultural differences. And so a key part in this game is to really look at how do you, you know, work with people from strange Denmark or how do you lead people from China and India or Sweden and so forth. So that's like a, a call in the game. And and what is all, of course, you know, when trying to doing this, it you also always have to find like a balance because you don't want to stereotype. And so forth, but also we need to recognize that well, cultural difference do matter. So, so I think, you know, often the leadership games address you know different personality types or, or different backgrounds to a certain degree, and and I think it's always you know we put a lot of effort into try to address these kind of issues in a respectful way. Um, but but also when working with this, and again we do it across different kind of cultures, you need also to have some cultural sensitivity. And and for instance, when you run a game, let's say with a Danish leadership group, then then uh, you know in most Danish companies, people are very outspoken and, and blunt. Some might even say rude. So so it's normally in a Danish company that you can like criticize the boss when she is in the room. But if you go to certain parts of Asia, that would be very odd. You know that they wouldn't fit in. And 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 from our experience, that 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 the games. Uh, are useful across different kind of cultures and backgrounds and so forth, but we need to build trust in the room, in the group. And and for instance, in certain parts of Asia where they have like a little bit more like traditional approaches to leadership and hierarchy, there we can have perhaps the same kind of conversations, but we cannot do it in a big plenary setup with everybody and the boss in the room. We might have to take the boss out of the room, or you have to come to you have the, the conversation in like a smaller group. So, so we do a lot of these kind of considerations when we set up the whole gaming experience and how we facilitate it. And then, of course, it's also just basically when you design, you know, making sure you have good diversity regarding genders and backgrounds and so forth. And, and for instance, we do quite a bit of business in like the Middle East. So, so yeah, we, we, we put a lot of effort into these kind of elements and, it, and it's not easy. Uh, So Sebastian, should we move into the world of research? Yes, yes. Let's a... let's move into the research portion. Uh, I know there are a lot of other questions in chat, and maybe we'll have time for them at the end. But I'm really interested to see this stuff, so <laughs> I'm going to chug it along here. Okay, super. So, so uh, yeah. So of course, we're very curious about you know because we we know from the client the direct feedback that it works and they're happy about it, and and and, and normally getting like very good scores, you know, different kind of message range. But of course, I'm super curious about like what, what, what make it work, and when it doesn't work, why is that, and so forth. And and we were lucky that a few years back we entered into like a, a, a collaboration uh, with uh, with a number of research partners, Copenhagen Business Schools, University of Sheffield, and so forth, and also the big uh, biotech company called Novozymes, which is like a yeah, industry leader within their field. 
And, uh, and what we, we had the opportunity to do here, and this was very much driven by a researcher called uh, Johann Simonsen Abelgo from, from, uh, from now Copenhagen Business School. He's a professor there. But, but, but what we had an opportunity to do here was to, to do an, a, 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 a program regarding leadership training, but where we had like really you know, intense research regarding like the outcome and what is working, what is not working. Um, so let me share a few of these insights. You know, I'm going to give you the short non-academic version, and uh, and, uh, and 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 I'm sure that that Johan will uh, will will could add a lot. Uh, so so you get the light version. So just a little bit about the experiment setup. So it was about this kind of Novozymes within the biotech industry. The change that they were looking at was about implementing uh, lean and working these kind of lean uh, you know process optimizations in the organization. And and, uh, and and they had like a target group of like roughly 700 people and and 35 different team leaders. And uh, so so the setup was that they tried to use, uh, they had like three training days using two of our simulations, game changes and wall breakers, and using those to help the leaders drive these kind of changes. Uh, what was so nice here was that we had a control group. So, so we were able to randomize it so that that uh, that half of the of the of of uh, of, of the group of, of participant leaders would uh, would be selected for for getting this kind of game based training, and the other half would get like traditional introductions. So so we had like you know a fairly good comparison group, and this is often when you do leadership development and leadership you know research, very often you don't have a control group, but in in this case we had like a real randomized control group. Then the research was a combination of quantitative and qualitative data and analytics. So they used, uh, you know, surveys, personal interviews, video documentation. You know, this blurred picture is from one of the video cameras, you know, filming and documenting, you know, specific sessions and so forth. We had these kind of researchers, you know, sitting in listening for hours of hours of, of leadership training, you know, making these kind of observations. And what is interesting also in the research and, and collecting data, they, they did not only talk with the participants, you know, what do they think and so forth, but also they were like talking with the employees of the leaders. So, so they would talk with the employees and, and get them to, to, uh, to get feedback regarding, well, did your leader change behavior, you know, after attending this kind of training and so forth. So really a way of like getting, you know, documenting like real time effects afterwards. And, and the data and finding of this research has been published in several scientific papers and, and some are already published and some are still pending peer review and so forth. Uh, and, and I'd be happy to, you know, if some are interesting to share, you know, some of these, these uh, the links to some of these kind of sources that are already out. Okay, let's get a little bit more into it. So in, in looking at how to evaluate if, it, if it's working, they use like the, I guess like very traditional like Kirkpatrick uh, evaluation model. So looking at the different kind of levels, so gauging the like directions, what are the participants saying themselves, looking at, you know, what did we learn, and then does it turn into to, to behavioral changes? And then finally, can we can we see an effect in like business results, specific outcomes and so forth? And, and again, the whole research kind of setup tried to look into all four levels, looking at the workshops, evaluations, follow-up interviews, and, and 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 so forth, and this is not easy. And uh, and Johan and his colleagues, you know, they can you know they can share a lot of good examples of of uh, of a lot of insights on these kind of levels and the challenges of getting you know really to get like that deep understanding. Um, what what I like to hear, share here is just a few of the of the key outcomes, and also some of the elements that that I think uh, the research are okay uh, for me sharing. Uh, so, so I think the first, you know, key take home message from them is that change management training should be engaging, fun, and perhaps a bit stressful. So, so when they tried really to, to, to map down, you know, what kind of training experiences help to deliver results afterwards, what, what gave benefits, they could see really at that the, 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 you know, making it playful, make it engaging, making it fun was a big part of it. 
So, so, uh, so if it wasn't engaging, it, it really didn't, uh, it, it, it didn't have an effect. And then it was also very important that there was like a little bit of pressure on people. If it was too easy, it was too smooth, well, we didn't have the benefits. So it's also important that, that we uh, apply some pressure. It has to be hard, has to be relevant, tough decisions and so forth really to drive the effect. And then a key element here is also really the quality of the dialogues. And this is also where they could see like the, you need good facilitators. So they could like really see a significant change if you had like a good facilitator, help to make connections to real life, probing questions, pushing people in a constructive way that 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 had a lot of, of, of added benefits compared to, you know, a less engaged facilitator or less experienced facilitator. So facilitation matters in these kind of settings. Then the second insight is that different groups react differently to change management training. So, so there is also something about like the, you know, expectations of participants. There was something about so, so, uh, so, so, so what what else was going on in that part of the organization? Uh, for instance, and again, I I don't know the specific details, but for instance, there were some of the teams that were part of the experiment. At the same time, they were suddenly uh, had to to start working in night shifts, and that of course created a lot of frustrations and frictions and so forth. And 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 really, there you can see that like some of the positive you know, some of the, the good benefits from the from the from the training fell short because suddenly something else would take all the focus in the team and so forth. So so you know the whole context and what else is going on is also an important part of it. Then they 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 could uh, you know document to see whether well, it's difficult but but doable and necessary to evaluate all the steps in the chain of events. So the whole Kirkpatrick kind of of setup. Um and I think that the, the the end conclusion is that it's 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 complicated, but change management training do seem to make an effect. And uh, and 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 both when they looked at like the employees, so the people you know, uh, the, the, the 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 people uh, the, the team members of of the participants that that they it had a positive impact regarding their perceptions and what they experienced, um, but also you know. Uh, some 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 positive outcomes regarding like the more like the business objectives and and so forth. So so yeah, just a few, some some interesting team home messages, and especially when you get into like the specifics of the playfulness, strong facilitation, and so forth. Uh, and again, there's a lot of details to this. This is some of the insights that we take in when we try to be better at facilitating and also designing other games. Okay, then trying to wrap it up a little bit and then we can get into more like a, a broader q and I, I just want to you know highlight a, a little bit of do's and don'ts that I yeah hope can be a bit helpful so so the first set is regarding well when we design or deploy games and I think from and again this is the the, the how, from our experience and the way that we do it you know I know there's many different ways and so forth but but this is our our insights so regarding do's you know make it visual and playful and, uh, and and for instance, there's like a Danish researcher called Andreas Lieberholt, and, and he did some research showing that 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 just making an experience feel like a game has positive benefits. So even if it isn't really a game, just the way you design learning materials and so forth, just to get like that kind of game kind of vibe feeling has a possible positive impact. So I think for us, it's important that it might be a game, but it also has to look like a game and the experience has to be playful. So we like to visualize it, making it playful and so forth. Then when we design, for us, it's very much about trying to design for behavioral change goals. And, and when we are in dialogue with clients about how to design and frame a, a, a good game, we always try to, to ask them, about, well, what, what kind of behavior would you like your, your, your colleagues to, uh, to, to have afterwards? So, so because one thing is about knowledge and insights and inspiration, but we need to turn it into real life changes for it, for, for it to have impact. And the more specific we can be about the kind of, of what changes we would like to have, then we can design more efficient games. And again, it's about designing conversations. So in many ways, the, the, the big design question for us is about, well, what would we like the participants to talk about? And what should be like the direction of that conversation? Then when, when you work with leadership development, especially there's like a, you know, you can distinct between just in case and just in time training. 
So just in case training, this is where you work with a situation that might come up later in your life as a leader. So it might be, okay, how to work with a, if you have like a this conflict in a team or you have a colleague who's a prima donna or whatever, you know, how to, how to navigate these situations. And this, you know, this kind of training can, can be helpful. But other parts of training is about just in time. So this is not about what if, but really about, you know, how can I be better at executing this new, you know, reorganization that's going to start four weeks from now. And I think from our back, from our experience that, that when we can, when we can design and deploy the games where the support, like really immediate challenges for leaders, help them to get the, their daily work, the most pressing, you know, tasks uh, to, to, to handle them better, then we have the best outcomes and people are more, are more happy about the kind of help that we can support. And then finally, I think it's also about, you know, being super pragmatic. Because when you design a game, it's so easy to make it way too complicated. And you want to add digital elements and QR codes and you want to add, you know, a lot of, of stuff. But when people have to deploy them, especially in big global organizations, you know, it has to be super easy. And sometimes you can get web access, sometimes there are like firewalls, sometimes you can't get the local printers to work out, so many challenges. So when we design the games, we really try to, to make it easy to deploy and very flexible. So you can adjust the duration and the focus and number of participants and so forth. If you make it too rigid, we can see that that can have an impact regarding you know, the, the pickup and the use of the games. And then there's like the list of don'ts. So again, I think a key point for us is don't make it too competitive. So unless the game is about being better at competing, then we'd like to downplay the competitive element. So we see like it's a, you know, it's it's a, you, you can add a small element of competitiveness and that can drive some engagement. But if the game experience becomes all about winning, then a lot of people, myself included, suddenly get very bad at reflecting and learning. So, so we, we, we're not so much into the whole competing part. Then it's about also, and I mentioned this before, don't making it too complicated for the participants, also for the facilitators. Um, and then it's also about the spacing of the training. Sometimes we, we like to cover too much too fast. And, and, and often we have clients who's like, well, we can only, you know, you said the whole gaming experience would take four hours, we only have two hours. Can we do it in two hours? And, and 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 in these situations, I really try to say no, because if we if we try to to move too fast along, we might be able to complete the game, but we're not going to have time for reflections and the learnings. So 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 it's really about you know spacing the whole experiences and like and for instance these leadership simulations that that we talked about earlier, normally we like to use these games as like a centerpiece of like a, perhaps a, a two day workshop. So having you know good times for framing, reflections, learnings, and, and, and so forth. Then a key element is also that really to have these kind of reflections, talking with your peers, we need a good level of psychological safety uh, working with the games. And, 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 and we use a lot of time as facilitators to create this kind of a, a trustful environment before we start to, 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 uh, to, to work with the learning parts and play the games. And for this, I think it's important that, that people feel safe. And if, if you make the game too much like a test, like an exam, then you're not going to have the reflections we're looking for. And, and I think that games, you need psychological safety to get like the full benefits, but also the gaming experience in itself, it's, if it's facilitated right, can also help to, to increase psychological safety in a team, building trust. And then finally, I think for us, it's about making it serious fun. And, and sometimes because you want to entertain people, you want to, you know, make people happy. I think it's it's easy to to create games that are a little bit too silly or that are fun, fun at the expense of the seriousness. And, and, and from my experience, I think that the challenge is to create games that are super focused on the business objectives, on the serious parts, but still where the whole process and, and so forth is still, you know, playful and engaging. And I think you can do both. Then a little bit of do's and don'ts about how to facilitate games. So this is like, you know, being the facilitator running the games. And again, I'm going to do this court, short, also because there's some overlaps to what I shared earlier, but but uh, but uh, try to remove the pressure on people, make it playful, make it informal and so forth. Be curious and inclusive in the dialogues, making sure that everybody contributes. 
uh, some people will have insights, you know, right away, very outspoken. Others, you know, they need a little bit of, of, of time. That insight might come, you know, during the break or the day after. And I think we need to cater to both. Uh, then we need to engage actively as a facilitator. And I think for this, you know, sometimes you can be like the game master, like running the game, the rules, the structure and so forth. And, and this role is important, but you also be to, need to be like a good facilitator to probe reflections, to help with the learning part and so forth. And especially helping people to link from the gaming experience back to real life. Then it's about mixing good formats. So perhaps a little bit of inspiration, you can give like a, you know, a brief introduction to a topic and so forth. You can run the game, but also small reflections, put in, you know, some good breaks and, and room for personal reflection. So I think like a, a good mixture of formats is important. And then very much about linking to follow-up activities. So even if you have a super good day, if there is no follow-up, if there is like no, uh, you know, anchoring of learnings and, and, and so forth, you know, even if people have great insights, a lot of commitment to, to go out and, and make some changes, you know, our efforts is very often going to fall short. So we very much try to have like a long tail to the training activities, doing different kind of, of, of follow-up in learning teams, follow-up sessions, creating different kind of toolkits that will help people to, mm -hmm. to apply the learning afterwards and so forth. And then finally about some don'ts. So again, don't overemphasize the competitive element. Uh, be careful not to, and this is especially coming from like an, an, an external consultant like me and my colleagues, you know, it's very, you know, you, you can easily, you know, end up being a little bit condescending, you know, telling people how to do their job, telling people how to be a, a manager in their company and so forth. And this should really be, you know, avoided. We should be super humble about that people and organizations are different and that the like the, the the textbook version of 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 what 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 is great leadership, that 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 book doesn't exist. You know, it, it's all in in flux, and you have to respect that everybody is trying to do their best under on, under their conditions. Then also, I think this was an interesting insight that we also had from the researchers that we were together with. They said that when they try to track the effect of like long academic lectures, so for instance, sometimes. If you do a game about change management, we might like to start out with spending one or two hours, just give a good introduction to theories on change management, John Carter and Rick Maurer and so forth. But what they could see was that afterwards, the participant, they couldn't remember anything of these lectures. You know, it was just blank. They remembered everything about the game and the game experience and these learnings, but the lecture we did before the game experience was a waste of time. So their insight to us was to say, well, you might want to bring in a little bit of, of, of academic inspiration or model, but try to do it in like in small learning nuggets and space it across the whole learning experience. But if you have like a big dump of academic, you know, insights to begin with, you know, it's a waste of time. People are not able to remember it. Mm. And, it and this also fits fairly nicely with, with my experience looking back at when I was in school. And then finally, it's about also making sure we address the important topics, so making it relevant and, and so forth, but of course, in a respectful way. Um, and then also, again, this is for facilitation. I think it's also, you know, really emphasized that this is about the participants. It's about their reflections, them sharing with each other. And if it becomes too much about you as a brilliant facilitator, if you like steal the, the spotlight, that is also something that should be avoided. You know, we want the participants to remember the learnings and their own reflections. We don't want people to remember the session because it was an awesome facilitator. That that's not an end goal. That just you know, hopefully something that can support. Wonderful, wonderful. And because we are running a bit over time here, I'd like to take it to the questions if that's all right. Ask. Sure, sure. Of course. One question, uh, have you ever worked with a specific military or a unit within the military to look at their organizational change? We haven't done it a lot. Uh, a few of my colleagues have, have you know, have, have done it a little bit with, 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 the, the, the Danish, uh, with Danish Defense. And also we have a little bit of collaboration with the Danish uh, Defense College that also uh, uh, they have some, some people there working also with war gaming and how to apply it. And, uh, and and so we have like a kinship and try to inspire each other, but uh, but not anything you know very structured. 
Okay, okay. And regarding the players of these games from the international orgs that you run them for, are there are they the players usually actual people that are responsible for strategy development, or are they the people that are leading the actual sort of operations of the company? A good, I think it's it's a great mix of both. So 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 for instance, recently we 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 worked with a with a with a large telecommunication company and did like a leadership training program with I guess like we were like running safety 70 different kind of training sessions using these games with I think like uh, more than a thousand managers. So that was like leaders at all levels. But 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 some of the other sessions, like I, I had like the example in the beginning of the of the industry simulation for this pharma company, and that was with the global top three hundred leadership team, so so you know VPs or, or, or senior VPs in in this kind of organization. So I think we we work with you know across the board different kind of levels. Got it, got it. Uh, do you have links, by the way, to those papers that you had talked about? Those research papers. I will uh, sure. I love to to share them. Perhaps I can share the PDF. Uh, sorry, my slides as a PDF later on, and then I can try to add a few of the links. Wonderful, wonderful. If you do that, I can email it out to participants of the meeting. Any further questions, guys? Oh yes, and his contact info. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. You were a great speaker and it was my privilege to introduce you and listen to what you had to say. Oh, we have one final question. I'm sorry. Someone has slid right under the line. Uh, have you, your clients or academic partners undertaken an ethical review as part of the research design process? Um, I'm not sure what you mean with an ethical review. This is uh, referencing a specific article that Ivanka Barzaska wrote for Pax Sims, which I honestly, I don't know what article that is, okay. uh, but a specific participant had this question. I, I, not, not, I, I, I think not, not in the way that, that, that might be implied there. I think that often, especially working with these, like, for instance, working with pharma companies, there's a lot of different kinds of rules and, you know, yeah, regarding compliance and business ethics and so forth. So I think often, especially when we do, for instance, some of the games we do with like, a, you know, at a company level or for top management, and often a, a, a part of the, you know, checking the, 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 the that everything are, are, are at the right kind of quality and so forth. A part of this is to check with legal, to check with business ethics and so forth making sure that, that things are, you know, there's no misunderstandings and so forth. But I think, but I never done projects where it had like an external review for somebody like a third party. Uh, but, and, but, but, but I think it's important and it's a big part of when we do like play testing and so forth, you know, really try to, to spot the blind spots and, um, and, uh, and, and work with different kind of participants. Okay. Well, hey, thank you so much for that. And to everyone who stayed, it's just proof that we had a very interesting speaker uh, here. <laughs> so thank you once again, Esk. I really appreciate it. Excellent. Thanks for now. And uh, yeah. Bye-bye, everyone.